Hello everybody, and uh, thank you very much for giving up your hard-earned lunch break. Um, if, uh, if I was to do an introduce, introduction for myself, then it would kind of be that, well, actually I started off in zoos and wildlife parks as a, as a keeper, so I know what it's like. So, uh, well, basically I'm used to the smell, so don't worry. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I've been working for a Cheetah Conservation Fund out in in Namibia for, for four years now. I've known Laurie for about 12 years. And um, I basically worked with 20 out of the 36 cat species and doing conservation projects and, and coordinating projects, um, places like Bangladesh with tigers and the Russian Far East with Amur leopards and, and such and such. But a lot of the work is kind of overlapping and, and you do see similarities. Um, there are massive differences. But when I talk to people about conservation, and it's amazing how many people don't understand what that means. It's just a word that's accepted. You know, conservation, oh, it means everything. Well, yeah, it, it does kind of mean everything, but it means different things in different contexts. So what I've done is I've put this talk together that, that tries to um, outline some of the projects that we do and to show the diversity of the conservation. So I've called the talks um, the diversity of frontline conservation, and then I had to really pick a, a special day when Laurie was probably drunk or, um, I won't say drunk, I'll say, you know, uh, yeah, that's right. Um, well, basically, because I, I, I stuck on a tag, it's not all about cheetahs. And you kind of have to whisper that if ever you're around Laurie, because her whole life has been about the cheetah. But you kind of get the gist of what I mean. I don't hate cheetahs, honestly. Um, but there's a lot more to conservation than just a single species. Because one of the key things is that any conservation effort that just targets on a, on a specific target species, a lot of the time, and there are exceptions, but most of the time they're destined to fail because they are part of a system. They're part of a whole a bigger picture. And uh, I'll try to highlight that as we go on. But as I said before, the cheetahs are quite special. Um, they are the fastest of all the land animals. They can reach speeds of up to 70 miles an hour. An acceleration speed of zero to 60 in just three seconds, faster than a Ferrari. Um, perfectly designed, long legs, slender body, giving the cheetah a huge stride. Dog-like feet. Um, the claws are non-retractable. Unless there's any scientists here, then I start getting angry and, and in a fighting mood, because they'll say, well, actually, Brian, I think you'll find that they're semi-non-retractable. <sighs> <laughs> Do they retract? No, they're non-retractable. Get a life. <laughs> Sorry, I am, on ang I am on an anger management course, but I'm doing really well at the moment. <laughs> but they just send scientists to me, they drive me nuts. Um, anyway, dog-like feet, claws are out all the time, semi, non, yeah, whoever. Um, but they'll use those claws, you can see them there as studs or cleats on a running shoe. They'll grip the ground, and then the next aspect comes in, this backbone, the spine of a cheetah, incredibly strong and flexible. About 60% of the total muscle mass of the cheetah is, is connected to that backbone. So those back legs planting in, the spine throwing the front of the cheetah out, giving a cheetah a huge stride. Stride of a cheetah at high speed can be measured up to seven meters, about 22 feet. And at top speed, three strides per second. Now I've been talking for a long time and you've been watching these pictures. If you look at that, that real time clock, that's 1.5 seconds. So there's so much happening, they're just a blur. You think you've seen it run, but in real terms you haven't. Small head for balance. Um, if they had a big head like a leopard, they'd be running along with their nose scraping along the ground. Wouldn't be very efficient at all. The towel is, is pretty unique as well. It's, um, it's like wing-shaped, it's quite flat, and they'll use that like a rudimentary rudder. A cheetah didn't have to go to Harvard to learn that the fastest route between two points is a straight line. You know, so they want to get the back end in line with the front end to carry on that, uh, that explosive running. Their front legs. Quite unusual as well. This front, the front legs and the shoulders are not actually connected to the rest of the skeletal system. They've got no clavicle. So it's just muscles and tendons. Gives it a longer stride and a longer stride length, but also perfect shock absorption. When they land on that hard African soil, not that that's hard African soil, that's hard Cincinnati soil. Um, and that hedgehog is really fast. I'll tell you, I've seen that. That hedgehog's, hedgehog's called Dave. Well, he was called Dave, because he wasn't that fast. Uh, but, <clears throat> so, the cheetah, you know, it's not all about cheetahs, but they are pretty special. 
See you later, Dave. Okay, so Cheetah Conservation Fund, we're, uh, we're kind of situated way out in Namibia. Um, we're a science, research and education center that just so happens, happens to be open to the public. Uh, we get huge amounts of people coming through us. I don't, don't expect you to understand or comprehend these figures that we get, but we get up to 6,000 visitors a year. Can you imagine that amount of people? <laughs> I think I've just queued up behind them for the, for the restrooms. But, um, you know, we, we are kind of stuck in the middle of nowhere. But those 6,000 people, they come and see us, and, and hopefully they go away learning something. Uh, we get coach, like bus bus groups through, our, the, the, the bus loads of American tourists are our favourite because I class them as, as entertainment for normal people. And um, so I keep moving, so I, I'm moving, I'm moving targets easier to hit, oh, harder to hit. But uh, you know, when you're talking about education and sharing stuff, it's all about interpretation. I won't insult your intelligence by saying, but I'll say it anyway, this is the map of the world. Yeah, we all recognise that. And when I tell people that the earliest evidence of a cheetah was actually four million years ago in the United States, over there, they get all possessive and proud and start chanting USA and all that. Oh, <laughs> um, <coughs> which is quite nice. You know, ownership is good. But you can't walk away and leave it like that because otherwise assumptions start coming into play. Because when they find out that the only place that you'll find cheetahs now is in isolated pockets throughout Africa, and a tiny little uh, spot over here in Iran, then they think, well, the cheetahs must be expert swimmers then. And they've swam, they've swam across the Bering Straits, had crab for lunch and washed, washed it down with vodka on the way down to Africa. <laughs> well, again, it's about interpretation. That's not the world of four million years ago. That kind of resembles it a bit more. The old Godwanas and all that business. And it kind of makes a bit more sense now because America was actually connected to Africa. So you can either go down this way, come down this way, and they left behind their, their closest living relatives of today anyway, which are the cougar, the puma, or the mountain lion, whatever you call it, um, and the jaguarundi in South America. So that's the, the last remaining relatives of that genetic tract. So who are we? Well, normally people shout out, who are you? But in this respect, it's who are we? Well, we're the Cheetah Conservation Fund. I say a lot of you have met and, and seen Dr. Laurie Marker. Well, we celebrated last year our 25th anniversary. We was founded officially in 1990, which coincided with the, with the uh, independence of Namibia. So Namibia is a very young country, just 25 years, exactly the same as, as CCF. It's down here. Up here, you've got uh, borders with Angola, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Botswana, South Africa, and this big wet, wet bit is the Atlantic Ocean. Big wet bit. It's a technical term. <laughs> yeah, oh yes, the scientists taught me that. It's a big wet bit. Um, why Namibia? God, the amount of times I've asked myself that question every time I want a decent pizza. You know, why Namibia? Um, probably the only country in the world that doesn't have a single McDonald's. You know, which some say well, that's a good thing, but the pr trouble is, is that I get South African TV and they advertise it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's just not fair. Well, why Namibia? Well, Namibia is home to around a third of the total world population of wild cheetah. About two and a half to 3,000 live in Namibia, out of a total population of between eight and 10,000. And that confuses people sometimes, because we're an organization that professes to try to keep these animals in the wild, in their natural habitat, and secure them for the future. And we're doing it in a country that's got more cheetah than anywhere else. So surely we must be making it easy for ourselves. Well, it goes beyond that because all the cheetahs are actually concentrated in this central area here. None of them live over here, because that's the Namib Desert, the oldest desert in the world. Fantastic place if ever you get a chance to visit it. But this, this central area here is the, uh, the farming heartland, the ranching heartland of Namibia. Now when I'm talking about farms or ranches, they're livestock farms, fundamentally. It's a desert country, not very much gr uh, crops grow there. Um, and it's all goats, sheep, and cows. That's the main thing there. I'll tell you that, uh, so when we, when we do this, what we've done is that we've actually made it harder for ourselves than anywhere else, because we're building models. And if ever you build a model, you need to go to the extremes, because then we're trying to transpose this model and move the same procedures and the same ideas and the same conservation initiatives to places like Botswana, Tanzania, Angola, other places. And nobody can say that they've got more cheetah. 
Nobody can say that they've got more farms. So nobody can say that they've got no more human wildlife conflict. So this model is an extreme model. So that's why we're in Namibia. And we're just situated there. Our closest town is a town called Oshirongo, which is very much like Tucson, basically. Because we've got a bank and a supermarket. <laughs> no, that's it. No. <laughs> So these are the cheetah range countries, typically. Um, again, a little bit confusing because they're not blankets and, and thick populations of cheetah all around here. They're isolated populations, apart from this, this area here, which is quite densely populated, but everywhere else is, uh, is quite isolated. The only uh, or, um, exception to that is the United Arab Emirates, and we're working very closely with them because of the illegal pet trade happening with cheetahs. You've probably all seen the internet pictures of the Arab in the gold Rolls Royce with the cheetah sitting on there. Well, they're kind of learning that that's not really a good idea. You know, for every 10 cheetah cubs that arrive, nine of them are dead, and the, and the tenth one only lives to about one year old. You know, they're coming in malnourished, they don't know how to look after them, blah, blah, blah. But whenever you're dealing with any type of conservation like that, human wildlife conflict, animal trafficking, you can't go in guns blazing with, you know, and make them the bad guy. Because if there's one thing <laughs> that you can't do, is tell a rich man what not to do. It's pointless. You know, it's pointless making enemies. The, tr the, the trick is, is to engage with them, to talk to them, to, uh, um, you know, give them alternative ideas, maybe. And by doing that over the last few years, Laurie's been over there many times, you know, we've got a lot of information out there and a lot of uh, cooperation. Um, and the, uh, the, the amount of cheetahs being kept as pets are reducing. And also, we're getting a lot of samples, both blood and tissue, and also, unfortunately, some of the cubs for, um, for necropsies. And that's uh, putting them through our genetics lab, so doing DNA analysis on them. It gives us a better idea of where these cats are coming from, so we can target where uh, the, the illegal traffic is, is, is happening. So, that's why in Namibia, that's why we're here, because 30% of the world's wild cheetah population live in Namibia and it gives the title of the cheetah capital of the world, which they're very proud of. And any country that's proud of something tends to look after it just that little bit better. So our centre, as I said, it's about 45 kilometres from the town of Ochivarongo, which uh, is a Herero word. Herero is a tribe. But this is our centre in CCF. Somebody that's a lot better than me at flying drones uh, flew this for me. Um, this is our, our veterinary and our office buildings. Uh, just over here, the large white roof, uh, in 2013, we had a huge fire that completely destroyed our visitor centre. So over the last two years, we've been rebuilding this. Uh, new classrooms, new um, education storage, a brand new fully functioning genetics labs in there, uh, as well as a cafe and, 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 and deck and, off, say, offices and storage. Um, over here is the Waterberg Plateau, a large mountain, 48 kilometres long. And everything that you can see, as far as the eye can see there, um, as it all goes around, the complete panorama, we're right in the centre, is all CCF. And this is our farm. This is our working farm there, goats and sheep. Again, all the way over here. We cover a total area, and I've got to remember my numbers now, because it, it covers an area of 46,000 hectares, which is 117,000 acres, which is 460 square kilometres, which is 177 square miles. So if you're walking from the zebras and get to the elephants and forget your keys, think how I feel. You know, it's, it's a long way to forget anything. But the numbers don't really mean anything. You know, it's not prime real estate we're talking about here. It's, uh, it, it's, it's failed farms. It's a series of eight failed farms that we've acquired over the years. We started off with one, and then we've just acquired uh, land adjoining our farms there. And you, you'll, you'll get to, to know that, uh, you know, just the size of the farms does, doesn't really matter. You know, it's not fertile land. So what's the problem? Why are we out there? What are we doing? And what are the main issues that we're facing? Well, some of them are quite um, banded around and you'll, you'll recognise the, uh, the names of human wildlife conflict. Yeah, we all know, we've all heard of that before. But in the cheetah terms, what does it mean? Well, for a start, we're not just talking about the cheetah, because remember, it's not all about the cheetah. So the human-wildlife conflict is the same with cheetah than it is for leopard, for hunting dogs, for jackals, baboons, any predator, because they're living on commercial farmland. 95% of the cheetahs in Namibia live on commercial livestock farms. 
80% of all wildlife in Namibia live on those same commercial livestock farms. So when we use the term the wild, that can mean anything and nothing at the same time. You've all heard it, you know, what do they do in the wild? What do they eat in the wild? What's the wild? You know, what is the wild anymore? Well, in Namibia, it's farms, ranches. That is the, that is the wild. So commercial livestock farms, predators, bit of a human wildlife conflict issue there. So that's one of the main problems that we're dealing with. Habitat loss, another couple of words that get misunderstood and not understood. You know, if you're talking about, uh, um, you know, the rainforest is deforestation, cutting all the trees down, taking away the habitat. You know, if you've got orangutans, then burning in the forest in Borneo for the palm oil trade, destroying habitat. In Namibia, we're not getting, the, the, the trees are not disappearing. We've got, we've got too many trees, too many bushes. It's strangling the land and I'll cover that a little bit later, but it just means different things. Too many words are banded around in the conservation world. world. They're accepted, but not understood. The lack of education. You know, things change, methods have to change. And when the farms are passed from father to son, sometimes the evolution of the farming industry doesn't follow and things fall behind and bad habits get escalated. And also, you know, the conservation, the future of farming isn't being taught properly or wasn't being taught properly in schools. So the teaching of the teachers is very, very important, as well as farmer training and every other type of training as well. And you've got poaching. Again, we're talking about cheetah conservation and talking about poaching. You know, if you're talking about elephants and poaching, you kind of know that people are poaching elephants. If you're talking about rhino poaching, well, the rhino horn, people poaching rhinos. Now, when you talk about cheetah conservation, they're not really poaching the cheetahs. You know, it's hardly ever done. It doesn't happen. But what they are poaching are the prey species. The springbok, the steambok, the diker, the oryx, the kudu, the red hearted beast, the eland. So if you take away the prey species, what are they going to do? They're living on commercial livestock farms. <laughs> they're going to go and eat the goats and the sheep. And then it becomes a human wildlife conflict problem. So although it's not directly attached to the cheetah, deal with it down here and you save it escalating into a massive problem up here. And you've got global warming or climate change. Um, some governments are really quick and, and good at uh, acknowledging the fact that climate change is happening. Not looking at anybody's government in particular. Um, but uh, no, the polar bears are not okay, I'm afraid. <laughs> you know, they don't, don't like all huddling on one little iceberg up there. Um, anyway, sorry. Anger management. <laughs> Polit polit politicians. Oh, bad as scientists, that lot is, I'll tell you. Um, but, you know, it, it does make a, a difference to, to, to world climates. You know, when you're in a temperate climate, you know, the changes, they're not as evident. When we live in a desert country, you know, you live in a desert state. You know the difference that with the seasons. We rely on our total rainfall that, that happens in about two and a half months of the year. That fills up the, the water holes and that has to last for the rest of the year. You reduce that by just that little bit, the water runs out before the next rains happen, stuff dies. Now, if that's not an effect to, to, the, uh, to the ecosystem, then I don't know what is. So global warming is an issue. But I'm going to talk about just a couple of bits and pieces. And one is human wildlife conflict. Um, it's the, the predators encroaching on the livestock farms. This is a typical cheetah trap. It's like a tunnel. And both ends, is like a crush cage that some of the keepers might use, similar, it's a bit of an old fashioned one now. But uh, it's got a trigger plate here, um, which is connected to these little hook bits here. So the moment that any pressure is put on there, both ends come slamming down. This farmer's cheated because he's put a goat halfway down the tunnel. That's not cricket, you know? And very few farmers would do that because they can't, you know, spare a goat almost. That's a valuable commodity. But what they'll do is they'll use the cheetah's natural instincts and natural behaviours. Anybody know what a play tree is? Yeah. A play tree is a tree that cheetahs have chosen as a communication point. It's normally quite a big tree and it's got a, a low slung, thick horizontal branch. You can't see it? Big trunk, branch here. So the cheetahs will jump up onto that branch and they'll defecate in it, urinate it, scratch it, rub it, mark it in any way. They're obsessed with it. They can't resist it. I always consider it like Facebook for cheetahs, you know, they, 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 they can't resist leaving their status whether the rest of us are interested or not, you know, it's, uh, oh, you got a baby, that's great, oh, you still got a baby, that's great, oh, and you got a kitten, and there's the kitten with the baby, we don't care. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, they can't resist it, 
So what the farmers would have done it historically is put this tunnel in line with a play tree and then surrounded the rest with this thick bush. So the only way that the cheetah can get in is through this tunnel that the, the, the plate is tripped, the cheetah's trapped. So quite often we was getting calls that saying, I've got a cheetah in a case trap, you've got 24 hours to collect it, otherwise I've got to shoot it. Very typical conversation. Then we have to kick into action. Then we have to start engaging with a farmer because the last thing that we want to do is go over there and collect that cheetah. Because otherwise you get a reputation of being the cheetah version of FedEx. You know, you phone them up, they come and collect it, then it's not your problem anymore. You know, but what you're doing is you're taking it off the farmer's land, which remember is the wild. <laughs> so you're taking cheetahs out of the wild and then the, the word will go around is that, oh, you got a cheetah, just trap it. And, and, and the crazy guy in brown will come and pick it up. You know, and you can't do that because that's not a solution for a long-term solution. Because we all know if you take one predator out, another predator's gonna move in. You know, and maybe if you take one cheater out, a coalition of four will move in. So it's not solving anything. And a lot of the time, the first question that you ever ask a farmer that says about this, this, uh, this, this cheater in a cage is the question, why? Why have you caught it in a cage? And it amazed me, absolutely amazed me, how many farmers didn't know the answer to that question. Because they've always done it. Cheaters are the enemy. So why not? He said, well, are you losing livestock? No. <laughs> and they honestly didn't know. It's just that they've always done it, father to son. You trap cheaters. So the fact that he's called us has given us a bit of a clue that he kind of cares. Because otherwise he would have just shot it or used a snare or whatever, or just left it to starve to death. So the moment that you're doing it, so you don't treat the farmer as the enemy, you engage with him. <clears throat> Sometimes that's too late, because you haven't got very long, we're a desert. You know, an animal's not gonna survive in that tunnel for very long. So you have to engage with the farmers at an earlier stage. This here is Dave. And Dave is a, a, a Herrero farmer. His name's not really Dave. His, his name's about this long and it's got about four clicks in it and I can't say it. Um, but whenever I talk to him, I call him Dave and he never complains. So his, his, his name from now on shall be Dave. We shall call him Dave. Um, but he's a communal farmer. He lives out in the communal lands. It takes about a day and a half to drive out there. Middle of nowhere. Doesn't own the land, just works the land. And he's a sustenance farmer. So he'll, he'll I nearly said grow goats and sheep, but... Goat and sheep seeds are really hard to come by in Namibia. Um, but you, uh, <laughs> he raises sheep and goats and he sells them and all kills them and slaughters them. It's basically just to survive from year to year to year. One thing I can guarantee is that old Dave there has got a better cell phone than me. So what we've done is we've set up a farmer helpline. Now all the farmers, the farmers groups, the cooperative groups, the farmers union, they have all know this, this uh, farmer helpline number. So old Dave there, if he's got a concern or a worry or he thinks something's happening but he's not sure, he's got somebody to contact. So we'll contact him. If we can't help him, we'll, we'll um, defer him to somebody that can. So we're kind of building a network of farmers, not, for, not only for us to help, but for, for, for them to help themselves as well. So now the, the, we're being proactive with the engagement. We're not waiting for the farmer to call up with a cheater in a cage. Now we've got this relationship with the farmers and we can give them different ideas and, and solutions to his problems or kind of belay his problems and, and, and just reassure him. Then we've got education. Again, we don't want to teach stuff after the event. You know, we don't want to teach, you know, you should have done this. We're giving them new ideas and new farming methods, a predator friendly farming system. Um, something that, uh, well, the, the, the whole aim is not to make them just no, um, no worse off if they don't go out shooting predators. What you're trying to do is make them better off as farmers and securing the pred predators in the wild. Because then everybody gains. Remember, 80% of the total population in Namibia relies directly or indirectly on farming. So Ochi Virongo, for instance, has got slightly more than what I listed before, but everybody that works in Ochi Virongo is linked to the farming industry because it's a farming supply town. So the lady in the checkout, she relies on Dave in a roundabout sort of way to pay, you know, to, to buy stuff in town, the farm workers, and it's a kind of a network of, of the industry. So it's very important. It is a very sexist society. You know, Dave's out there with his goats and his sheep, and the ladies are at home cooking, looking after the kids. So we'll, we'll teach them all different things like um, 
alternative livelihoods. We've, we've got a creamery at CCF and we can go out and we can teach them how to make cheese um, out of goat milk. One, it's a good source of calcium and, and, and vitamins for, for their children, but also something else that they can sell. When we're doing the farmer training courses, we invite the ladies along to learn gardening and, and growing vegetables and fruits and vegetables. We're now fully self-sufficient at CCF on salads and some vegetables. Uh, because some genius, probably from, uh, from a university in Europe somewhere, uh, went over there and told them that they can't grow anything because it's desert. Well, if you go and plant something in the middle of the desert in the sand and don't water it, yeah, that's quite accurate. You know, not a lot grows unless you're into cactus, you know. But if you kind of look behind you, there's 250 goats and sheep and they supply you just with a little bit of manure, you know. So you can use that manure. You can teach them how to compost and grow stuff. And that's become incredibly successful. So you're making them healthier and you're giving them a, 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 a different livelihood. And then... You identify problems, you design solutions, and you implement the solutions. This is a Herrero lady, typical dress of a Herrero. Um, she'd have nothing to do with Dave. Look at the state of him. She's far classier than him. But, um, but this is Paige, and this is one of our livestock guardian dogs. Oh, look. This is uh, an Anatonian shepherd dog. She's my dog. She lives with me. Um, she was a rescue. She took a long time to rehab, and she's kind of not suitable to go out with farms now. And, uh, and she's, she's, a, she's a great dog. She's quite a big dog. Um, the only thing that, that's not going for her um, is that the fact that she's called Noodle. <laughs> Any vet techs here today? No vet techs? Oh, good. Never trust a vet tech to name an animal. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, she's a lovely dog, and in my front room, it doesn't matter what I call her, but when I go out in a bush in my bush hat and my bush gear and stand there and go, Noodle! <laughs> does nothing for my, for my ego. So, you know, apart from that, she's all right, but Noodle, for God's sake, you want to call her Bloodlust or Satan or something, you know, or, or, you know, or, or Rock and Roll. I could say, Rock and Roll! That'd be all right. Anyway, so, sorry, moving on. Um, oh, look, oh, oh, oh. This is Dave the puppy. Um, and uh, Dave is he, there, he's about uh, six weeks old, and this is his mum, that's, that's, uh, that's Isha. And this is Alaya, and Alaya is a fully-fledged working dog. She's out there um, every single day. She's also one of our breeding dogs. She's given us three litters so far. She's one of our many breeding dogs. And on each litter, she's given us 11 puppies. Um, and the survival rate for them are 100%. They're a remarkable dog. Absolutely remarkable dog. Now, people think when we talk about them, and you could kind of sell it that way, uh, which I don't, but, you know, they think there were some sort of geniuses. We were in our lab, invented this super species of dog. <laughs> well, no, you know, if the truth be known, these dogs have been around for about 5,000 years. They originate in the Anatoli Anatolian Mountains in Turkey. And for those 5,000 years, they've been protecting goats and sheep. It's not a new idea, but it's brand new to Namibia, you know, and it's not been, it wasn't used in that part of the world uh, before. So it's just using an existing idea. You don't need to invent the wheel, you know. If something works, if it's not broke, then don't fix it. And um, for those uninitiated, these are sheep, all right. <coughs> all right, I'll get, I'll get a bit more technical. They're actually called Damara sheep. And Damara are another people or another tribe. So you've got Herero, you've got Damara. They're also called fat-tailed sheep. It's a bit technical, but the reason why that is, I'll explain it for you. See, they're sheep, and they've got really fat tails. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and they're perfectly adapted for, for desert kind of environments uh, because they'll use the fat in their tails the same as your camels would use the fat in its hump. It helps them sustain um, life a little bit longer in, uh, during droughts. So basically, the whole thing is a predator-friendly farming system. It's not a cheetah-friendly farming system. You can't focus on that individual species. You can't go over to Dave and sort out and, and, and have a look and say, sorry, Dave, your problem's a leopard and we're the cheetah people. Good luck with that. You know, that's, that doesn't do it. You know, that's not going to solve anybody's problems. So it's a predator-friendly farming system. First of all, it's training the farmers, just getting them, just tweaking what they do and adapting this the way that they do it. Uh, using a corral system, if you don't know what that is, it's just a small enclosure. You know, with a larger commercial farmer, you can build that out of chain link, you know, like some of your enclosures are. Dave can't afford chain link, so you can make exactly the same thing out of thornbush or acacia. Doesn't matter, does the same job. 
You know, it doesn't have to look good. There's no visitors to look at it or complain. <laughs> Been there, haven't you? And also the kill ID, because, again, the cheaters have got the blame for, for so long. It's thought that the cheaters are only responsible for about between 3 and 5% of livestock kills, which kind of doesn't matter because it's a problem. It's a predator problem. But sometimes you need to understand what the problem is before you can implement a solution. And we try to empower the farmers to do that. Because a leopard will kill something in a different way than a cheetah does, than a hyena does, than a jackal. Or a, even a domestic dog sometimes are the, are, the, are, the, are the culprits. They kind of don't, you know, it's not an obvious target but, uh, or, or, or suspect, but sometimes it is. So we train the farmers and the farm workers how to identify kills. It's like CSI Namibia over there, it is sometimes. Um, and the way we do it, we've got kind of a series of life-size polystyrene goats, which are really good, but it's really embarrassing if I get them get pulled up in, and they're in the back of my car by the police. But it's like, a, it's like one of those weird parties in Tucson. You've all been to them, but you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's really weird. But they're carved and built in such a way that it leaves those clues. And, and, and uh, you, know, you can identify if it was a leopard that's your problem or it's your domestic dog. Because all the things in the world, all these corrals and everything like that, is all well and good. But then if you open the gate and let your domestic dog in, and that's the one that's killing the goats, then you kind of should have known that before. And then you've got herder training. I mean, I can't speak highly enough of the Anatonian shepherd dogs. I think they're a fantastic species of dog. But what they are absolutely useless at is herding. They have got no sense of direction whatsoever. They, 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 you know, they, they're, they're born amongst the goats and the sheep. They see them as their family. They'll just go with a flow. You know, wherever the lead goat goes, you know, the dog goes, ah, oh, you carry on, I'll just look out for cheetahs and leopards, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, if you, if you left it to them and they carried on going, they'd be looking out for polar bears and dolphins by the end of it because they'd, they'd, they'd never come back. So a herder, a herder is a man or a guy uh, or, or a lady if she wants to do it, but they don't. Um, you know, so unemployment in Namibia is running at about 35%, so it's never difficult getting, employing somebody. And it's a good investment because we don't only treat, train the herd as a herd, we also train them in basic livestock management as well, which they've never been taught before. A lot of the stuff, especially, I mean, you, some of you must deal with hoof stock and you know about trimming hooves. It's kind of 101 stuff, you know, but it's only 101 because that's what you was taught first. You know, so a goat with overgrown hooves is going to be slower than the ones that haven't. And they're the ones that are going to be lagging behind. And we've all seen the documentaries. You know, what happens to, to one that drops behind that's the slowest? Well, that's the ones that they was losing in the bush and ultimately being killed. So just by teaching them how to do that and teaching them how to do the herding, um, it, it's, a, it's a huge tool, not just for the safety of the flock, but also the, the, the welfare of the stock. And more um, goats and sheep that get through to market, the more profitable the farmer is. And then we've got the livestock garden dogs themselves. They're born at our centre. We've bred over 650 dogs over the years. Right at this moment in Namibia, there's 185 out working. Um, and then we've set up programmes in Angola, Botswana, and um, Tanzania as well. We don't run those programmes, but we've brought people in, we've trained them how to do it, and we give them breeding stock to start that. Because it's not just selling puppies. It's a programme. It's a process. There's lots of different aspects to it. And our commitment um, to that program, as far as the farmer goes, is for the lifetime of the dog. So the dog actually goes out to the farmer after the farmer's been trained at about 14 weeks of age. So it's a little tiny puppy. It doesn't go out as a fully fledged livestock guardian dog. Because fundamentally what it's doing is it's guarding against anything that's out of the ordinary. Anything strange. Doesn't matter what it is, anything strange. So if we raise the dog for a year and a half on our farm, and then send it out to a farm to work, it's going to be barking its lungs up for about three months because everything is going to be different. The people, the vehicles, the landscape, the animals. So it has to grow up in the environment that it's going to work for the rest of its life. When we send them out, they've been neutered or spayed and they've had all their, their three jabs as well. They, we get them done very, very early. Our first follow-up visit is at four months and then at six months and then every 12 months for the rest of that animal's life. Not only are we checking the welfare of the dog, because these are not sacrificial animals. You know, I have to point that out to some people. Um, but, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that that's the case. They're being fed properly, treated properly, worked properly. But also, we're keeping that engagement going with the farmer, because things change. You know, these dogs can be working on these farms for eight, nine, ten years. 
and things change, droughts happen. So we can keep that engagement and we can help him with training and his neighbours at the same time, creating more engagement. We used to give them away for free, no, no charge for any of this at all. And then we soon found out, and it wasn't rocket science, that anything that's free has got no value. It's a bit like the pet trade. You know, cheap pets are not looked after quite as well as expensive pets. And I'm guilty of that. When I was little, it used to be tortoises. You know, you could buy a tortoise in a pet shop for like the equivalent of about $2. I used to buy one at Easter. I used to die at Christmas, but it's fine because I bought another one at Easter. Now they're about $600 each. You know, and people are giving them supplements and UV lights and, 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 and vibs the size of my front room, you know, because they've made that investment. You know, because anything that's cheap is kind of almost disposable. And that's, can't, that can't be the case of any animal. Now we charge the farmer a signing on fee. We, do, we still don't sell the puppy, but we sell, we, we, we charge them to, to sign into the system. And we charge them $1,000 Namibian dollars, which sounds a huge amount of money. But translated to US dollars, that's about 75 US. Or in, in Namibian terms, that's about a goat and a half. So it's just, that in, just enough so they've invested. And they've, uh, you know, they, they, they've, uh, they, they do look after the dogs. And we hardly ever have to seize uh, a mistreated dog now just by charging them that amount of money. It's amazing. So all of those things working together, that basically is fundamentally is the, is the predator-friendly farming system. All those things put into place, what does it lead to? Well, it's proven results. That's why we do it. That's why we've been doing it for the last 16 years. And that's why now, um, you know, farmers are, are, are asking us for the puppies because it leads to the reduction of losses of livestock to predators by between 80 and 100%. It's a no-brainer. Now it's not you know, banging on people's doors saying you, know, you should do this to save the cheetah. Now it's farmers telling farmers telling farmers and they're beating on our door saying, for God's sake, train us and give us this system. So it, it's completely come circle. And now we're not, we haven't got to sell anything anymore. We haven't got to convince people anymore because there's proven results. And the, the, live, the, the, the predators now are not killing the livestock. So the farmers are not killing the predators. And if something's not your enemy, you know, it's just like, just like in your zoo, somebody will learn something more about an animal if they're not scared of it than if they are scared of it. Would you agree with that? Well, same thing with the predators. If they're, if they're not an enemy anymore because the livestock is fine, they learn more about the predator. And again, it's the assumption because we're all animal people here. We all understand about animals. We've all learned about animals. Well, in the wild, they're just an enemy. They're just an enemy, enemy, enemy. They always have been. So the role of the predator in the ecosystem wasn't understood. Remember, 80% of the wildlife population in Namibia live on these commercial livestock farms. Now, they can include springbok, stingbok, dikers, the tiny little antelope, cute bambies, uh, as well as the, 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 the oryx and the hearty beast and the kudu and the eland. You know, we've seen those animals. They're huge. They eat loads of grass. They drink loads of water. You know, the, the two precious commodities in Namibia. So if you haven't got the predators, who's going to survive? Well, everything. You've got the old, the weak, the injured, the slow, the stupid. I think I've covered everybody. But um, they're all going to be there, and they're all going to be drinking the farmer's water. So in effect, the, the farmers now see the predators as an ally. They're out on, the, on these. These farms are huge. They can be 20,000 acres, just a normal-sized farm. And they're out there controlling the flocks and keeping the numbers down and making the farmer more profitable. So all of these things is, uh, you know, are, all, are all linked. So the farmer is okay and his dog and his little farm there. You know, Alaya and her flock, they're nice and safe. They're out there and come back every day. And then you've got these three guys here that represents all the predators in Namibia. But they are cheaters. <laughs> Basically, bottom line, end of the day, everyone's a winner. It's holistic conservation. You're not just looking at the cheetah. And sometimes, if you treat um, conservation as an industry, which kind of it is in a roundabout sort of way, well, if you look at it like that, sometimes the most valuable product in an industry is a byproduct. And a byproduct here is that the cheetahs are fine. They don't need feeding, they don't need grooming, they don't need their nails cut. <laughs> They've survived for the last four million years. Just give them the right environment and they'll be okay. So let's talk about habitat loss. I'm a bit conscious of time. Um, when we talk about bush encroachment, it's, it's kind of trees and bushes that are taken over Namibia, strangling Namibia. 
Um, it's, uh, it's not a, an alien species, it's supposed to be there, but just not in this number. You know, it's, uh, we call it acacia. Acacia is a bush. It's a big, angry bush. It's huge, it hurts, it's nasty. It's 20 feet tall and 20 feet wide and goes from the crown to the roots as one big block. The thorns on it are the size of my finger. They're as sharp as a stiletto knife and they hurt <laughs> and they don't break. You know, you cut them off, you can use them as skewers, toothpicks, anything. Tent pegs, some of them, huge, like this. No, not really, about that, that, about that big. Um, but what it does is it, it causes impenetrable barriers. So migration routes can't happen anymore. So you're creating, I mean, these are miles thick and miles long. You know, you're, you're isolating um, uh, populations. Um, and also, it's the biggest cause of desertification uh, in southern Africa. So it just kills everything underneath. No grass can grow. And if no grass grows, pretty much nothing else can live. You know, the birds, the reptiles, the insects, nothing goes in there because nothing supports it in there. So it's killing Namibia. But why? It's supposed to be there. Well, something's happened. There's a disturbance in the balance between the bushes, the trees, and the grasses. So something has happened. What's happened? Well, there's a few things that happened. No one thing can be made to blame. You know, you've got drought. You know, if you get a, a longer drought, the grass, the grass dies, the acacia is more hardy, the acacia will grow, the grass can't regrow, creating a desert. Overgrazing. If you graze too many cows on one piece of land, they eat all the grass, the grass don't come back, the acacia does, you created a desert. You've got the loss of the mega herbivores, your elephants primarily. You know, 100, 150 years ago, hundreds if not thousands of elephants used to do the grand tour of Africa sort of doing figures of eights. You know, they're, they're nature's bulldozers. In our modern heads, they do loads of damage. <laughs> well, in real terms, they don't. They generate regrowth. They get rid of old stuff so new stuff can grow, you know? And they don't do that anymore. Elephants are kind of quite, quite uh, um, confined to, to relatively small areas. They don't do this grand tour anymore. And they certainly don't do the grand tour through Namibia. There's no real wild elephants, no forest elephants. There are some desert elephants, but you can't do a lot of damage in the desert. And then you've got fire suppression. Again, the experts are going over and says, oh, fire's a bad thing. How you protect against it is you build big fire breaks so fire can't spread. Fire is supposed to spread. It's supposed to happen. Now, you take a different attitude if, if it's heading towards your beach house in California. I get that, you know. But this is the bush. Lightning happens. Fire comes. Old stuff disappears, new stuff grows. It's happened for millions of years. But now, they've squashed that, they've stopped that. So, all those different reasons together has caused the bush, the balance to go, and the bush to take over. These are cows, and these are donkeys. <laughs> Guess what this one's name is? Steve. That'd be ridiculous, that one's Steve, that one's Dave. <laughs> Come on, keep up. Um, loads of facts and figures, not gonna give you them all, um, but basically, um, in 1950s, you needed less land to graze more cows. The bush takes over. I won't get too involved because it annoys me. Um, but this, this thing here was done by some smart scientist. And he says, oh yes, one LSU requires... I said, hang on a minute, what's an LSU? He says, oh, it's a livestock unit. So you mean a cow then? <laughs> why? It's the same amount of letters. You know, why don't just put it so like normal people can understand it? You know, uh, was it a code or something that only scientists can understand? Drive me nuts, they do. Uh, but basically, in the 50s, you needed 10 hectares, about 25 acres to graze one cow. Now, today, you need almost treble that. It's actually gone up, those figures. And you need three times the same, same amount of land to graze the same, well, not the same cow. They don't live that long, but a similar cow of similar size, of similar breed. So it means that if you're using, if you can, you can graze less cows, then you earn less money. So the economy is affected. About a billion dollars a year are lost. And don't forget that 80% of the population in Namibia rely on farming, directly or indirectly, for their livelihoods. So this bush is affecting everything. The grass doesn't grow, the antelope don't come in, the predators can't feed. Everything is affected. So what do we do about it? What we don't do is we don't overreact. Well, the biggest disasters in conservation have been done by people overreacting. So you don't go in and say, oh, your problem's your bush. Let's get rid of the bush, you know, because other things rely on it as well. 
I mean, personally, I think birds and reptiles are a waste of space, but, you know, it's... Um, no bird or reptile keepers, that's all right then. Um, but, uh, but yeah, they're part of the system. So the big trees, you know, the birds that live in there, the, the weaver birds, the, the, the cavity dwellers, like your hoopoos and your, your hornbills and your, and your owlets, they're all part of the system. The reptiles rely on the trees. The insects, you know, kind of turning, turning the soil and fertilizing the soil. And then you're in a desert, you need shade. <laughs> Cut down all the trees, you've got no shade, you just created your own desert. So, what you do is you don't go out and get rid of it all, what you do is you go in and you harvest it. Sometimes the easiest solutions is to think like an animal. They've normally got the answer, especially when you're talking about the environment. When I flew in on the aircraft, you, 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 you saw the wings of modern aircraft now, they're kind of out like this, and then they've got the turned up bits at the end of the wings, and they discovered, you know, all these teams and banks and banks of scientists, that if you do that, you make, you, you make it f more fuel efficient by about 18%. Mm. Mm. How'd they learn that then? They looked at an eagle. <laughs> That's how eagles fly. You know, they're soaring around. They want to be um, conservative with their energies. You know, so nature's got the answer. So almost what you're doing is you're putting yourself in the mindset of the elephant. What would the elephants do? What were they doing? And if I, can you tell them I'm busy? Thanks. Um, but then, so, so what you're doing is you're clearing corridors through the bush. You're opening it up, but then you're leaving some because there are giraffe, there are rhino out there that, that rely on it. But also the big stuff always has to stay. So it's only your small stuff. And when I say small stuff, it's still six feet tall and impenetrable. So it's still doing the, 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 the damaging work. And then what you do, you can't just cut it down and leave it. It will last there forever until there's a fire and you can't always guarantee there's going to be a fire. And dead acacia is, is just as damaging as live acacia. It's still sitting on the ground. So you, you chip it, you break it down into, into finer component, components. So putting it through the chipper, it creates wood chip. And if there's one thing Namibia's very good at, it's drying stuff. <laughs> We've got that down. Yeah, you put it outside, it dries. <laughs> That's it. So you, all this stuff here is dried wood chip. Now, we've actually uh, developed and built uh, a small factory in the town of Ochivarongo, and we're just in the process of moving it out to our centre uh, to cut down transport and make it cheaper to operate. So we put it through that wood chip, we put it through uh, like a grinder that turns it into a sawdust. That sawdust is fed through these machines, and these are heat extrusion machines. So that puts the, um, the, the sawdust under high heat and high pressure. That changes the molecular structure, then out the other end comes this long tube here. And these saws come down here, saw it off, and it turns into what you'd probably recognise as a duraflame log. Yeah, everybody know what that is, like a fuel log? The difference between the duraflame log and this log is that there's not a single additive in that whatsoever. It's pure acacia. The new factory that we're just building now, and hopefully it started to go up while I've been away, um, it's also going to inc incorporate something that we've just been sponsored to get, and that is a, uh, a generator, a power generator, that's powered by biomass. So we're going to have a factory making bush block that's powered by bush block. It's the closest thing you can get to perpetual motion. So, that's bush block. So when we do it, we do everything again, doing it as a model, doing it to the highest possible standards. We do everything to Forest Stewardship Council regulations. It's a worldwide, a uh, world-known um, certification. So nobody can say that you can be trained better. Because what we're doing is that we're moving into the communities and we're training people in forestry. Because where Dave lives, over in that region, the Herero land, it's dead. It's too much bush. No grass, no antelope. No, nothing. So we're training them over there because we was part of the scheme and, and the subcommittees and the working groups and goodness knows what that's just secured um, the, the new power plant that's being built just outside the communal lands of Herero land um, that's going to be powered by biomass. So we're training up a workforce of, of Namibians, of Herero, to this standard. So once the forest, once the, the power plant's there, there's a Namibian workforce ready to move in. So as we're doing that, fundamentally what we're doing is buying the bush off them. So we're teaching them how to cut it, they're cutting it, harvesting it in a proper way, sustainably. Then we're buying it, we're making it into bush block, and then we're selling it on. So we're, we're a middleman, just for now, until it's established, and then they will take it over. We don't want to be the bush block kings, you know. We've got, we've got loads of stuff to do, we don't want to be doing that. 
Um, so what we do is we, we, we take advantage of the, the trade system in, in Namibia. When, you're, when you visit Namibia, you, you drive up to CCF very slowly behind a big heavy truck because all the imports come in from South Africa. It's quicker going down to the capital because that's south and all the trucks are empty. So we buy that empty space in the trucks. We get this stuff and put it over the border. We've got a distribu distribution agent over there. And I don't know if you know what a bry is. It's like a barbecue, yeah? And the South Africans are actually bry nuts. They're bry crazy. It's worse than Louisiana down there, I tell you. And the, I mean, you give them a chance, they'll bry cornflakes. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know. So they'll buy as much as we send down. So we've got that market. We're keeping that flow going. So during all this time, the, the habitat's being restored. Employment is being, being made. The antelope are moving back in. Then, once you've got animals in a natural environment over there, tourism starts to come in, ecotourism, because they wasn't going over there before because there was no animals. Now word's getting out, the antelope are over there. There's a potentially wild dogs can start moving in there, huge thing. So we started taking on lots and lots of, of Namibian um, interns in tourism and hospitality. We're willing to take the risk on them. Sometimes we're catering if we've got visiting groups for 80 or 90 people, so it gives them good um, experience. Whereas the, the private lodges won't take a risk on them because you know, the private lodges are, are charging a lot of money for people to stay a very short period of time and they can't make a risk of a student making a mistake. We're willing to take that risk, so we're, we're employing that. Also, we're training them on crafts over there as well, making good quality crafts, getting Namibians to teach Namibians um, how to do it. Again, you think, well, there's so many crafts in Africa. Well, I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but if you go to you know, Angola or Namibia or Botswana or Uganda or Kenya, it's all the same stuff. It's not the locals that are making it. All that stuff, a lot of the time, comes in by container from factories in Kenya. So it's not supporting the locals. So we're teaching them how to make um, local crafts, good quality crafts. And, uh, and, and distributing And at the moment, while that, while that system is, is working and starting to go, we're working as a distribution agent there to keep the flow going. And we're, we're starting to sell stuff in, in US zoos and UK zoos, much the same as the Snow Leopard Trust have done for many years very successfully. So all of those things stems from a, a problem bush. So who are the winners in this one? Well, you've got the people, obviously. You, you're creating employment and uh, you're creating new industries and, 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 and stuff like that. You've got the farmers. The farmer's land's being open. He can graze more cows, earn more money. So therefore, the people are also benefiting from the farmers. And then you've got the, the economy. The more people you put to work, the more taxes that are being paid, the economy gets. We export. So you get export tax from the, uh, uh, from the bush block as well. And then you've got the wildlife. Well, the wildlife's actually got a, a habitat. You know, so you, you, it's kind of one of the fundamental things that you need to survive is habitat. So the wildlife is doing really well. And the environment, you're addressing that balance. And not only that, at the end of this project, you, you've got a completely eco-friendly fuel system as well. So it helps on so many. And all these things, all this training, all these initiatives, in the background, quietly, not doing much, just surviving, are these guys. So it's not all about the cheetah, but at the end of the day, it's all about the cheetah and the leopard and the hunting dogs and the lions and the hyenas and everything else that's living there because that's the balance, you know, and to keep that balance is the whole aim of conservation. So how does it all work? Well, you've got all these things here. You've got the education. You know, you've got, we, we train the farmers. We train, you know, the crafts and the, and the school kids. A thousand Namibian learners come through our centre every year. We go out and visit 20,000 Namibian learners right the way across. We, we train the next generation of conservationists. We've just got our first um, uh, geneticist through her master's degree, Namibian. Um, we've got uh, three Namibians just got through their ecology master's degree. So we're building for the future because at any time they could kick, kick the rest of us out. You know, they could revoke our visas and then what happens? The last 25 years is going to go, you know, down the toilet, basically. So you're building it up so Namibians can, can govern it themselves and run it themselves, not just as farm workers, but as the scientists as well. And then you've got the research, you know, all different types of research, biomedical, landscapes, um, you know, eco e ecology as well as geneticism as well, genetics rather. So what do you need to do all that? Well, you need a few ingredients. Everybody know this lady up here? Yeah? 
Dr. Laurie Marker. She came over, she's dedicated the majority of her life to conservation. She doesn't take no for an answer. And if it is a no for an answer, she'll look, like, she'll, she'll look for a different question. You know, um, and, and, and it's her that, uh, that, that engages with the people and accepted by the people. Sometimes it takes seven years to sit around somebody's table, you know, because you have to understand the history, which I won't go into now. But the Namibian history is quite a bloody history. Um, so understanding that and, and, and like, you know, never say die attitude. And that's why we're in a position where we are today. This is why these projects are so successful and moving forward and growing and diversifying all the time. This guy here is called Dr. Sam Najuma. And Dr. Sam there was the founding father in Namibia. He was the first, first president of Namibia. Um, and Namibia is one of the most forward-thinking countries, as I said. He, it, they was the first country ever to include conservation within its constitution. Um, at independence, they, they dedicated 20% of their total land mass as protected conservation areas. You know, and it was him that stamped that. Mind you, Laurie was around, and I've got a suspicion she had something to do with it as well. Um, but, you know, it was him that, that set the platform that these conservation initiatives can work. Now it's not just CCF that's being used as models in all the Cheetah Range countries. It's Namibia as a whole that's being used as a model country because so many countries throughout Africa have overreacted and now are suffering, you know, because they've just gone gung-ho, bow, uh, bow to, uh, to public opinion, and, and the countries are suffering. Then you've got education. Well, education is the foundation of everything. And it, but education isn't just, isn't just teaching stuff. It's also learning stuff. Things change. So you have to learn as well as, uh, as teach. But you're, you're, a, you're a, like a viaduct for, for information and, and, and change. And then you've got research. You know, something that you learned 20 years ago is not necessarily true today. So research is, is constant, moving forward all the time. Cheetah ranges have changed over the last 20 years because the landscape's changed. You know, it's not, it's not surprising, but what, how has that changed? Where are the cheetahs going? So as the population have grown, and it's pretty much doubled in the last 24 years, the cheetah population in Namibia. So where are those cheetahs going? Where do we need to get ready for the cheetahs to go in? And that's why we've set up the programs in Tanzania, Botswana and Angola. So we've set up the livestock guarding dog program so the farmers are all okay. So when the cheetahs do start to move in and the leopards, then everything will, 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 will can do it. So it's proactive rather than reactive. And then you've got collaborators. You can't work alone. You know, it's pointless us building this island utopia in, in Namibia. You know, that's the same as a zoo. You know, no different to a zoo. If a zoo just looks at itself and just breeds its own animals and doesn't talk and doesn't cooperate with anybody else, you're going to have some very interesting animals over the years. Um, you know, so now you have to work with other zoos. You know, you swap and change animals, keeping the genetics flowing. You know, and, and some of the new scientific ideas comes from other zoos. It's collaborators, very important. Then you've got the communities. We all understand the value of the communities. That's where the cheetahs and everything lives. If you don't engage them, don't give them ownership, don't give them stewardship, then why should they look after it? So the communities are as important as anything else, including the farmers. Then you've got frontline staff. It's okay having all these great ideas and publishing a paper saying this is what people should do. Well, it's, it's initiating and implementing these solutions. And frontline staff, both foreign and Namibian, are incredibly important. International support, not just financial support, but also scientific support. We're quite well equipped. You know, we're quite good at what we do, I think. You know, genetics lab is fully functioning, great. The vet clinic is very good. It's okay. We get by but we're kind of not quite up to scratch with the Smithsonian. <laughs> yeah, so, and so many other establishments around the world. So we work with them, we collaborate with them. You know, it's the modern world. You can have an, a digital x-ray from, from, from the wilds of Namibia on somebody's desk in the Smithsonian, almost at the click of a mouse now. So those, that type of international support, incredibly important. And last but by no means least, and I'm not just saying it, you know, just because where I am, and I'm not blowing smoke up any part of your anatomy, but it's zoos. Zoos are incredibly important in, in the role of conservation. And, and it kind of annoys me when, when I have to convince people of that. You know, they're, they're as much a cog in the machine than any other part of conservation, as me, as, as the guys that work with me, as, as, as anything else. You know, because zoos are, are, are one, are very good at, at raising funds, because, you know, if I took any of our projects there to the shark tank, they would laugh me out pretty quick, you know, because there's no financial returns on this. But ec ecological ways, it, they're, they're great 
successful programs. So yes, they help us with funds, but also education and, and, and awareness. We get 6,000 visitors a year. You know, it's not that many. We are isolated. So zoos engage people and, and educate people. Hundreds of millions of people visit zoos every single year. Now, just point out that my background is in zoos and, and, and wildlife parks. I've kind of been there. I know that. I've done it. I'm not that stupid and naive to think that everybody that comes through the gate is there to learn something. But my philosophy is, is that a very small percentage of a very large number is still a very large number. And those are the people that you can engage, and those are the people that are passionate, and those are the ones that want to learn, and, and those are the ones that are the future of conservation. You know, the, the, the school groups that come in, you know, you, you've seen it yourself. There, there will be a few that will be really interested. There will be some that don't seem interested, but you never know who you're dealing with. They are the future. You know, I'd love to think that I can live forever, but, you know, probably not going to happen. You know, so the next generation, the education, the exposure, um, that's where zoos play their role. So, you know, if you take any cog out of the machine, it doesn't work properly. And the zoos are as much part of the machine as anything else. Whether you're a zookeeper, whether you're an educator, whether you're a, a financial person, whether you're admin, you help your machine work that ultimately helps everyone's machine work. So, zoos, mega important. That's you. But we're CCF. We do loads of stuff. We do cheetahs and trees and bush and puppies and... Everything. But if you want to know anything more, if you want to see anything, uh, that any of the other projects we do, and we do, we have got some um, educational material on there as well that you can pull off. That's our website address. We are on Facebook as well. That's me. Um, I'm kind of doing a tweet, and I'm on Facebook too. So if you want to follow me on my travels and what I do uh, back in Namibia, uh, then you're more than welcome to. But thank you for your time. Sorry I've gone over. Sorry if I've stopped you going back to your hard-earned work. But thank you so much. <laughs>